Hello, hello everyone, and happy Thursday. I hope um, wherever you are at in the world, you are having a great day um, on this beautiful, thankful Thursday. I am gonna check and make sure we are live here. Yep, in the group. Um, so wonderful, wonderful. Hopefully I will have some of you popping on. I know this is a hot, hot topic for everyone. And yeah, so I guess we'll just leave it right there, right? So um, I apologize, I do sound a little nasally. I have some kind of weird congestion going on. I'm not really sure what is happening. Hello, Priscilla. Um, so let me know if you have any questions as we're moving along. You guys know, hi, Judy. I like to talk fast, so hopefully I won't be going too fast. Um, but yeah, I feel like let's go ahead and jump right in. So I know so many of you that are here in the group, you feel like you are struggling with this weight that like just doesn't budge, right? And it can feel like once we hit this like 40-ish age, right, that, that losing weight can be a lost cause. But what I wanna tell you, what I wanna promise you is that it's not, okay? When we get more mature, right? A nice way for, for saying aging, getting older, our metabolism does begin to decrease. And as we enter into perimenopause, which is usually around mid 40s for most of us, yeah, it does happen a little more drastically. So with the decreasing levels of estrogen in during perimenopause, then you also lose muscle mass. And muscle has a much higher um, metabolism than fat. And so what happens when all this slows down is the weight gain really begins to happen disproportionately in our belly area, right? And here is the thing I do wanna tell you is when you do officially hit menopause, right? Like 12 months with no period, that's the official word of menopause. Things don't just kind of change right back, right? Like this is, like things have to change forever, right? We're not talking about doing some of these things and just doing them for little bits of a time. Like this change in your body is is kind of how it's going to be, right? But here is what I want to tell you. It's not all bad news, okay? We can do some tweaks to how you're moving, to what you're eating, and you can lose weight and maintain a healthy weight um, through perimenopause, through menopause, and even beyond there, okay? So I'm going to break down five of the steps that you need to take to have this happen. And here I want to preface, preface this, and Janine, one of my clients, jumped on here. She will be the first one to tell you that it's not just one all by itself that is going to change things, right? Right now we have with our hormones fluctuating with everything, we have this like choreographed dance going on and you adjust one thing, that's great, but you've got to be adjusting all of them. So anyway, the first step that I recommend, and most of my clients when I talk to them, they've already kind of done this, is that you get a full physical, okay? To get to have goals to to get the results you want, you got to know where you're starting. Now, and I know so many people want to go in and find out, are they in menopause? And yes, there are some blood tests they can do, but most of the time your primary care doctor is going to go by your symptoms in order to decide where you might be at. Now, they will do blood work. Of course, we want to check for thyroid function. That is extremely important. High cholesterol, heart disease, high blood pressure. Of course, all of that. But here's what I want, want to preface, I want to say all is when you go to the doctor, they're not necessarily going to go like, oh, here is exactly your hormone that is off. So you can fix that. Because here is the thing. If your thyroid is off, they're going to give you medication to fix that. But that means all your other hormones are out of whack. And they're not going to tell you how to fix that. Okay? Um, 
But again, thyroid really does seem to coincide, it did for me, with, with menopause. And thyroid hormones play a huge role in regulating your metabolism and how your body uses nutrients, right? And it just seems to be a very common thing. As we age, it gets sluggish. Now, there is a whole other um, body of thought that is saying that our hormonal imbalances and our other hormones is actually what causes the thyroid to be sluggish and then it's like this little vicious cycle so it's very very interesting um but you don't care so i'll just stop um and hypothyroidism can be very sneaky and that's what i was diagnosed with and it is actually underdiagnosed in um undiagnosed excuse me in many many women um and here's another interesting fact i found out that 90 percent of the people who have hypo Thyroidism also have Hashimoto's, which is an autoimmune disease. Interesting. So go to the doctor, get the blood work done, find out, make sure things are working properly. Re expect that they're not going to tell you how to manage your menopause symptoms. Expect that they might um, just want give you antidepressants. Um, you know, depending upon your personal history, they might say hormone replacement therapy. That's a very personal decision. But be ready for the fact that they are probably not going to tell you the things you can do to manage your menopause, including the weight gain, naturally. It's just not something they're trained in. I mean, I do fault the medical profession, but I don't fault the individual, individual doctors. It's just not in their curriculum. So, okay. So that is first. Go to the doctor. You can't, you got to know where you're starting. Okay. Now, number two is... I'm calling it tweaking your food choices. So this is not about going on diets. This is not about depriving yourself. If you are, and I just did a reel on this the other day, if you are not eating enough food, and that might have been one of your tactics in your 20s and 30s, and even maybe early 40s, that you would use when you wanted to drop some weight you are absolutely going to have the opposite effect happening, okay? Do not drop your calories. I mean, that 1,200 number gets thrown around all the time, and that is a real stupid number. Um, I would not recommend dropping under, the, under 1,500 calories. Um, not if you don't want to stress your body out, and we're going to talk about what stress does to your body, high hormone cortisol. But to adjust... Your, to your body slowing metabolism. You do have to make some changes. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not going to say you can do exactly what you've been doing and get the results you want. But so it's really important to now start paying attention to the quality of the calories you consume. I will never, ever be the coach who tells you to count your calories. But not quality, not quantity, but look at the quality. Choosing nutrient dense, nutritious foods with, they're going to automatically have fewer calories per bite. And if you're eating that most of the time, it's going to help you feel full and it's going to help you feel satisfied. So instead of restricting foods, saying no to all your favorites and feeling deprived and sad and stressed out about that, you want to reduce the more calorie dense foods, your fried foods, your high fat meals, your cookies, your cakes, your candies, your chips. You want to replace some of them with nutrient rich, less calorie dense foods like vegetables, fruits, um, salads, bean dishes, broth based soups, whole grains like oatmeal. And again, we're just talking the majority of the time, you guys. We're not talking about saying you're never going to have, you know, chocolate chip cookies again. But the high water and the high fiber content of foods like all those ones I just mentioned help increase the volume in your stomach and they make them more satisfying. So you automatically are ingesting fewer calories because there is some truth to like calories in calories out right there is a smidgen of truth to it but what's more important is the quality of your calories all right it's also looking to make sure that when you're putting your meals and your snacks together that you are putting together complete meals now i'm not a macro counting coach or anything like that but it's real easy to make sure that you're 
snacks and your meals have lean protein sources. They have quali high quality fats. They've got your fiber and they've got some good carbs, right? That strategy is going to help you feel more satisfied. When you feel more satisfied, you guys, you're going to have less cravings. And you all talk to me all the time about how much you hate the cravings, right? So if you want to have less cravings, you got to start looking at what you're eating. And as far as carbs go, I am never going to tell you to go keto. Never. Your carbs are your body's preferred source and your brain, preferred source of energy. Okay. But you want to go for the good carbs, right? The whole, the unrefined carbs, not the carbs you're finding in processed foods. You want to make sure you've got a mix of food groups, of meals and of snacks right? Um, you want diversity, okay? So maybe instead of a big bowl of cereal with milk, for those of you that still eat cereal, a smaller amount of cereal with adding in some fresh fruit and some fresh nuts, right? Like you can take something that's maybe not as quote unquote healthy as you would like it to be and turn it more healthy. And choosing to eat a more plant forward, mostly whole foods diet that is low in added sugars the majority of the time while saving room for some of your fun foods, your indulgent foods, what, whatever you want to call them. You guys, we have made it this far in life. The last thing I want to tell you to do is deprive yourself. And I know you don't want to do that. Now, I'm curious, for those of you that are on here, let me know in the comments if you have tried this deprivation. You have tried telling yourself, no cookies, no candy, no nothing. And let me know how that went. I'm curious, right? So working on increasing the amount of plants will not only reduce your calories, but here is the other benefit it's going to do for you. It is going to increase your gut health, okay? Now, an unbalanced gut. So that is where your beneficial bacteria are all compromised by other bacterial population is often the underlying cause of everything from acid reflux and IBS to, in some cases, depression and anxiety. Now, these issues are common during the phases of menopause, so it makes gut health even more important during your midlife. If you are in any of the stages of menopause, if you're in peri, if you're already like entered into, if you're just in peri, your your body has become, begun its decline in estrogen production. Now, we used to think that your estrogen production was just all about your ovaries, but now we know that the gut plays a pivotal, pivotal role. So fluctuating levels of estrogen are the elemental causes of menopausal and perimenopausal symptoms like hot flashes, depression, mood swings, best breast pain, insomnia, now, I want you to, yes, Amy, exactly. And then you wanted more. It's psychological. That's exactly what happens. But I want you to take a wild guess as to what regulates estrogen levels. What were we just talking about? It is your microbiome. It is what's going, it's your gut, you guys. So what little estrogen you've got left in production, that is what's determining how it's getting circulated. In fact, there is a subset of bacteria called the estrobolome that specifically works to metabolize all these estrogens. Because this is the thing, you, like some of your estrogen, if you've got too much estrogen in your body or you've got too little, both are going to have bad, are not going to have good effects. But in a healthy and balanced gut, the estrobolome um, maintains the homeostasis that's going on. So a healthy estrobolome the gut's estrogen-specific microbial network will effectively me metabolize estrogen and keep all your estrogen levels in check. But if your gut health is compromised in any way or if it undergrows a, a drastic change like perimenopause, things are going to get off. So boosting your microbiome health prior to that and if you are in it now, is going to have a tremendous effect on your menopausal symptoms, including the weight gain and your overall health. So balanced eating is what I recommend for everybody. 
I use 80-20 method uh, with myself and with my clients. 80% of the time, you are eating what you want to call, and I try not to use ever good and bad foods, but you're eating the healthy foods, the whole foods, the unrefined carbs, the plants, the vegetables, and then you're saving room for 20% of the other things. So there's never a time when you're telling yourself you can't have something. It might be I'm not cho- I'm choosing to not have that now because I'm having this thing, but I can choose to have it tomorrow. Okay, so that was a lot on food, and that is where I start with all my clients, is we start with the food aspect because it is by far the most important and it's going to have the quickest effect. And now, so now we are at step three. Okay. So step three is to move your body and start pumping some iron, right? So we've got to get our bodies moving. And I'm not talking about just getting out there and walking 30 minutes a day, but I'm talking about getting up from your desk multiple times a day if you are you know working nine to five whether you're working at home or you are working in an office i don't care don't tell me you don't have time to get up you do if you don't have a standing desk then just stand up and fake it do whatever you need to do but walking zumba biking spinning i still love tai bo right running hiking whatever works for you and that is definitely one of the most important parts of exercise you guys is it has to be something you enjoy or you will not do it. But exercise not only helps your heart, it helps your mood, it helps your sex drive, helps prevent osteoporosis, it helps with hormonal hormonal, um, balance, and it actually will give you more energy. If you are waiting for the energy to exercise, usually that won't happen. If you exercise, you will get the energy. But if you're only doing something like cardio, you are going to lose muscle. Now, I already talked about it. The less muscle you have, the slower, the more that's going to slow down your metabolism. So we want to add in some kind of strength training, some kind of weight training to, to build muscle and improve your metabolism. Um, and you can do things like, you know, traditional weightlifting. And for some people, you might think that's boring or intimidating, but I want to ask you, have you ever actually tried it? Um, There's also, you know, high intensity um, interval training. Um, There are obviously the machines at the gym. There are a ton of videos you can access on YouTube that will give you strength training for over 50, resistance training. I mean, you, if you don't have weights, you can order them from Amazon, super cheap, you guys. You can just uh, go and grab some cans out of your pantry and use those. There is no excuse. You can find 20 minutes, you can find half an hour to exercise every single day. Um, And it really, it's, it's a no brainer. You have to do it. Or maybe you want to get into yoga and Pilates. Now, those two specifically um, really do a lot to engage your muscles and your cores. You can get into power yoga or vinyasa or hot yoga. And then they are also going to help with strength and metabolism. Then there's all the martial arts, right? Like, And those, when you get into the martial arts and you get into the yoga, they are so, yes, exactly. Um, they are so beneficial in stress reduction as well because they are, are are really helpful with calming our brain. And they can help with things like hot flashes, insomnia, brain fog, okay? Um, so again, check out what's online. If you, if you are not a go to the gym person, you guys, don't force yourself to go to the gym. Find a workout you can do at home, okay? If you do not create a plan for your exercise, it will not happen. And I'm talking create a plan like, okay, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I am going. This is the time. You schedule it. It's on your schedule. It is like a doctor's appointment. It becomes a non-negotiable. Okay. Number four is to develop a set of stress management tools. Now, I just mentioned a couple. Exercise is a stress management tool in a huge, huge way. But as we hit these midlife years, the pressures for so many people have just piled up, right? You think about the typical ones, right? Whether it's caring, still caring for kids or grandkids or maybe aging parents, facing financial financial burdens, dealing with the demands of a job, running a house, whatever it may be. 
When you are experiencing stress, your body responds by releasing the hormone cortisol. Now, if your stress diminishes, your hormones return, your hormone levels return to normal in a perfect world. But if you are like most people and you are experiencing ongoing stress from adulting, your cortisol levels generally will stay higher than you would like them to be. And for most people, if you really take a step back and you think about it, you are operating in a chronic low level of stress all the time. And this can set off a series of biological events that may lead to increased appetite with more cravings and a propensity to store fat in your belly. Because you see how all of this is so interconnected, you guys. So deep breathing exercises. I share this exercise with all my clients, a five, five, seven breath, where you breathe, you inhale from your belly going up through your chest, breathe for five, um, inhale for five and hold for five and then um, exhale for seven. That is a really good way to trick your body into thinking you're relaxed and it can help lower your cortisol levels. So um, you as a person have to figure out what it is that reduces your stress. But if you do not make this a priority, it's gonna have a lasting effect. So for some people, it might be a hot bath, a cup of tea, it's a massage, it's meditation, it's spending time outside, it's exercise. Um, Using a weighted blanket when you sleep. Um, making a gratitude list, um, just sitting, even if you don't meditate, just sitting and not doing anything, right? Like you have to figure out how to calm your own brain. Now, one of the things I work on with my clients is managing their mind because we have this thing that we do when we have these thoughts that are swirling around, we actually think that these thoughts are like an observation of the world. And we don't realize that they're just thoughts that we're thinking. And if they're just thoughts, we can change our thoughts. Mm. It is so juicy, I can't even begin to tell you. Um, so, and that is can be really helpful when it comes to um, your thoughts kind of spinning out on you and creating uh, you know things that lead to like, you know, almost panic attacks or anxiety attacks. And that happens to all of us, right? I mean, stress is real, you guys. Don't ever, ever think that it's not. I mean, raise your hand if you know you experience, you f- f- actually feel stress at least a few times a day. Because here's what I want to tell you. If you feel it a few times a day, then you're probably in chronic low the entire day without even realizing it. You're just so used to how it feels that you don't even notice it anymore. All right. So number five here is to establish good sleep habits. Now, I wonder if Janine's still on here. So when I first wanted to Janine to um, change her sleep habits, she thought I was pretty insane. Like I was supposed to be telling her what to eat, not... um, making her change what time she went to bed. But when you are under rested, your appetite regulating hormones get all short circuited, right? So your appetite goes into overdrive. But the hormones that can tell you, yes, she is here, yeah. The hormones that tell you that you're full don't necessarily kick in promptly. So studies also show that when you are sleep deprived, It also alters how you think about food. So you have stronger cravings for sweets and other less healthful eats. So sleep is paramount in what you're going to eat, right? So having a good sleep practice. So the stress management kind of comes first and the routine exercise is going to have some positive effects on your sleep. But For many people, you have to take additional steps to help you sleep better. You have to be proactive about going to bed and waking up most days at the same time. Your body does like that better. And giving yourself wind down time at the end of the night, 30 minutes to unwind, to disconnect from all your digital devices, no phones, no scrolling while you're laying in bed, right? Like whether you realize it or not, that is causing your brain to stay active and that is not going to help you with sleep. Now, there are some other ways you can help with sleep. Now, sticking to 
not having a ton of alcohol. Um, and as much as we think that alcohol relaxes us, and I know, I don't know if she's here, but my other client who likes her wine, and I get you, I love wine too, but it actually leads to more sleep disruptions as opposed to helping us, we think, this get better sleep. And maybe it's not taking long and late afternoon naps. I'm not saying napping's a bad idea, but late in the day, probably not going to be helpful. Getting the caffeinated drinks um, out of your afternoon repertoire will help a lot. There are guided sleep meditations that you can listen to, the sounds, and then there are ones with actual like um, relaxing affirmations, right? For some people, especially if you've got the hot flashes going on, turning down the temperature will be super helpful. I mentioned those weighted blankets um, before for relaxation. Um, being Making sure you're comfortable when you go to bed. So if you're having the night sweats, um, you know, dressing in layers so that you can put, put, take things on and off. Now, here is the thing, all of this, all these five things, these are not all of them. I mean, because I could go on and on and talk to you about how important it is to eat slowly. And I could talk to you about how important it is to drink water. But these are five of the biggies, you guys. And these are five of the foundations of what I work on with my clients, besides all the other little things kind of rolled in there. But here's what you got to know is that healthy, sustainable weight loss isn't about dieting. It's not about quick fixes. And that doesn't matter what your age is. Even if you lost weight by skipping meals in your 20s and 30s, think about it. Did you normally gain the weight back? I want someone in here to tell me that they didn't eventually gain the weight back. Deprivation and go on, go off approaches ultimately backfire because none of those get to the root cause of why you're eating. You just deprive yourself of food and then you go off and you go back to eating how you used to eat. There's been no change. 